We are together and joining us are the four researchers from the faculty of ICT, all of whom are currently on Zoom. So let's begin, shall we? So the first speaker is Dr. Ruben Faruja, and he's here to explain how we can learn about Earth from space. Ruben is a senior lecturer from the Department of Communications and Computer Engineering, and he will talk about the research conducted at the faculty of ICT related to Earth observations. Over to you, Ruben. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ruben. And I will be talking about our research that we are doing in the field of Earth observation. Uh, at the current time, while we, I, I'm talking, there are thousands of satellites revolving around the Earth, um, each one taking measurements, like images, optical images, thermal images, um, uh, radar data is being captured as well. And all this information is being used to, um, for various applications, for example, for global warming and monitoring, or for urban planning. Um, and several other, th other things. Um, our group was um, actively involved in, in this field um, in the past years, and we were awarded a number of projects. Um, one of them, the first one awarded, was the Satfire project, and I will talk a bit briefly about all these projects. The Satfire project was um, initiated in 2018, where the aim was to try to improve the resolution of um, satellite systems, the resolution of, their, of sea surface temperature, um, Sentinel-3 um, is nowadays available for free in terms of data um, under the Copernicus program, but the problem is that the resolution of the sea surface temperature is quite low. The advantages of that is that it passes over Malta, for example, every day, so we can capture temperature information on a daily basis, but the resolution is an issue. Um, so the aim of the project was to use deep learning, machine learning, and so on, to try to improve the resolution. As you can see, there, on the right is one of the results that we obtained. You can see that the edges are sharper, the, the quality is better, and if you try to extract the front, um, you can see that um, the change from um, cold to warm um, uh, can be detected much better on the higher resolution data rather than on the low resolution data. We have collaborated also with the Department of Geosciences, where we have integrated this um, in their hydrodynamical model to try to predict, for example, currents at higher resolutions, the currents around Malta. Um, another project, interesting project that we are working on is the Saturn project, where the aim of this project is to use Earth observation data and try to estimate, to derive a digital surface model that is like measuring the heights of everything in, on, on Earth from space, which is not a, um, a, a, an easy task to do. Um, uh, now, how, how does this work? To explain it uh, briefly, it's like how we, we perceive the 3D environment. Uh, we, we look, when we look at, a, at an object, we use our, our right eye to look at the object. We use the left eye to look at the same object, but from a different perspective. And all the differences obtained by the right, right eye and the left eye are combined together to give us the depth sensation. The same thing here, where we use an image, two images, from, uh, from the same satellite system at almost the same time. And we try to analyze these differences to measure the height. And right now, we are able to do this. Um, um, and this project will end um, roughly in January. Um, now, we were also awarded to recently, uh, we started like a month ago on two different proje other projects in the field. The Warm Meal project is more targeted versus agriculture and energy and water. Uh, more mostly water. We are trying to predict um, the water consumption used in, agric in the agricultural fields uh, using earth observation um, data. We are going to install nine, nine uh, meteorological stations in around Malta, scattered around Malta, to capture some meteorological information. That information from these stations, combined with thermal and optical data, will be combined together to be able to predict the, the water consumption use in agriculture. Obviously, we have challenges. These things are not easy. The biggest challenge is the resolution, because Malta is small. And of course, the resolution of the satellites is problematic for us. Um, another um, uh, project is the Coastal Sage project, where here we are going, trying to use radar data. Because in, in space, there are satellites, Sentinel-1, that has radar technology. And with this radar technology, there are processes that allow us also to measure 
millimetric movements of the rock. And this information can be used to identify which areas are more dangerous. And uh, actually, we're collaborating with the Ministry of Infrastructure on this project. OK, so that's all from my side. I think we can move to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Faruja. And our next speaker is Dr. Ingrid Vella, who is a lecturer at the Department of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Malta. She'll be talking to us through her journey in researching the brain. Up to you, Lara. So, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. And in these five minutes, I will be fast forwarding through my research related to the human brain. So to be honest, ever since I was young, I used to wonder about what is it that makes us move. And 10 years ago, when I was doing my final year project in my undergrad, I was very lucky to be working on this. So I was looking at signals generated by the brain when we move our right and left limbs. So basically what happens is that when we, when we move, there are electrical signals generated in the brain, which give commands to muscles to then, to then move. And to do this, I had used data from an EEG cap. Uh, actually, to be compliant with COVID, I had to put uh, a mask on. And these uh, um, electrodes measure the voltage generated by these signals in the brain. So we have movement over here, okay? And electrodes are measuring the signal, okay, the voltages, and our data is here. So what we did is we first cleaned the data from, for example, um, the information from blinking, okay? And uh, we then classified the, we looked at the data that we had, which was labeled, and we classified the left from the right hand movements. Now, luckily for us, the data, which is the signals which are generated when we actually move and when we imagine to move are very similar. So we could use this classification system to then use prosthetic, prosthetic devices. So this was the aim behind that particular research. And then moving on from this, I got very much intrigued into this sort of stuff. And in my master's, okay, in biomedical engineering, I had come across this question, which basically was, why do we need a brain? Like, what is the difference between organisms that have a brain and organisms that don't? And I'll cut straight to it because I am limited by these five minutes. We need a brain to move. So there is this famous neuroscientist, Daniel Wolpert, who had said that we have a brain for one reason and one reason only, and that is to produce adapt adaptable and complex movements. There is no other reason to have a brain. And in fact, there is a particular organism called the sea squirt, which when, when it is born, it looks like a tadpole, and after some time, it finds uh, a rock and it attaches itself to it and it stays there till it dies. And the first thing that it does as soon as it attaches itself to its rock is it digests its own brain. So this further on substantiates this uh, remark that we have a brain for one reason only and that is to move. And this famous neuroscientist Daniel Wolpert had also said that to understand the movement is to understand the brain. So in my master's, I had done this research on, on how we move, basically. So we had used this motion capture suit. OK, this is a sort of technology which is used in, in such movies, like, for example, in TED. This is the exact one that I had used, which had sensors located throughout. And I was measuring movement from healthy participants and from, and from patients who had Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And I was looking at what is different in the way they move. One possible application could be to be able to objectively okay, assess the way we move rather than having to go to a physiotherapist, for example, which might be biased. And another possible application could be if you have sensors, for example, on an elderly person or a patient, um, they would be measuring their movement. And if something is wrong or not normal, they could alert a family member or a doctor to, to you, of course. Fast forward a bit more, okay? Uh, so I have already spoken about EEG, but I was also lucky to work on something else called MEG, which stands for magnetoencephalography. And I say I was very lucky because there are very few um, MEG scanners in the world. So I did this when I was in the UK, and the UK has 10 of them. These are very, very expensive machines, which work in a way similar to EEG because they also measure the brain signals but rather than measuring the voltage, they measure the magnetic field generated by these, these signals. 
the advantage, one of them, is that they are not affected by the thickness of the scalp. Okay, EEG is affected by by such um, by, by the thickness of the scalp, for example. So I have worked on better ways to carry out data analysis on this MEG MEG data. This is what an MEG scanner looks like. Okay. It is in a magnetically shielded room because it measures very tiny magnetic fields. They're called femtotesla. Femto is times 10 to the minus 15. So if you have to think of the Earth's magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field is more than a billion times stronger than what measurement this machine can measure. Okay, so these are very, very tiny, tiny fields. Diet and Next, I left this for last because this is where my main research interest lies. Okay, this is MRI. So I'm sure most of you have seen an MRI, but if you haven't, this is an image generated from an MRI scanner. It's actually my own brain. <laughs> and this is an image also of my brain indicating the areas that I know for sure work. <laughs> I don't know about the rest, but these definitely work. They work when I tap my fingers. Okay, so this is a sort of images that MRI can generate. And my research, though, was I was focused on the, on the imaging of the human brain. However, what happens is this. When you have a magnetic field, like in, in MRI, for example, we need to have a constant field throughout. OK, so if it's clinically, it needs to be 3 tesla throughout. If it's, uh, in my case, I was doing this on a 7 tesla, it needs to be 7 tesla throughout. However, if there are two different materials, then that will not keep the magnetic field the same. OK, there will be inhomogeneities, you call them, in the magnetic field. And in the past, they used to cater for these inhomogeneities generated from the environment manually, OK, so by fitting in material in the scanner. But of course, to be able to tune this for each and every person, it's difficult to every time insert material in the scanner. So I devise a computational way of, uh, of overcoming these, these inhomogeneities, basically. So that was a very, very fast forward <laughs> of my research in relation to the human brain. I hope that you have enjoyed this very, very condensed journey of mine. And that I have instilled in you the interest to someday also study the brain. And, and I'm very much in awe of the beautiful selfies of your brain. So uh, well done with that. <laughs> Going on Thank to you our... look at my video, though, because my video has gone crazy. Oh, it's OK. We still understood everything. And we were quite odd, uh, speaking for myself, for sure. And I'm sure the, our audiences are the same. Our third speaker is Dr. Chris Porter, who will be showing us a bit of his own go ongoing work at the Human Computer Interaction Lab at the faculty of ICT. He is a senior lecturer with the Department of Computer Information Systems. Up to you, Chris. Hi. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, okay, so I don't have my selfie of my brain, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay. Happens to the best um, of us. <laughs> it's all right. Um, so um, when I was asked for a title for this part, for my part, I thought hard about what we do. And, and basically, it all boils down to one thing. It's, it's making technology work for people. Um, most of our work falls within the field of human-computer interaction, um, in short, HCI. And HCI is it's a multidisciplinary um, field of research focusing on the design of computer technology and, in particular, the interaction between humans and computers and technology, whatever that might be. So um, as, as um, you said, I, I uh, we have this lab at the faculty, the Human Computer Interaction Lab, through which we support um, our students um, in their research work, particularly at, at postgrad, postgraduate level. So we try to build on our understanding of how people interact with technology to work and to live. Um, and uh, there are several interesting projects going on. And today I'll be talking about two areas of research that we have ongoing work in. So let me start by looking at the first one. So the first one is human factors in software engineering practices. So through this research, we turn our attention to the software engineering, software engineering as a profession. Um, and we, inv we investigate it from a human perspective. So we know that the profession is, is a challenging one, and practitioners, people who work in the field, um, report issues such as increasing task complexity, um, larger volumes of work, wider variety of tasks, and uh, higher context switching between one task and the other, and uh, higher expectations overall from individuals. 
the problem is that one thing remains constant, it's the human being. Um, and Ingrid can, um, can attest to the fact that the brain has not evolved as fast as work has. Um, so so uh, we are evolving, work is evolved, sorry, work is evolving much faster, at a much faster rate than the human brain is, of course. And, um, so treating this as a human problem, we are able to produce a better understanding of how work is carried out generally, and we can support that through better tools, um, uh, process improvements and recommendations. So, so we seek ways to understand uh, and when possible measure human behavior uh, while performing tasks um, or using tools as used within the industry. So, so studies um, look at um, aspects such as task difficulty and uh, cognitive workload, disruptions, the effect of disruptions on people and their work, as well as behavioral strategies. We also use some more experimental techniques as well as uh, methods such as collecting physiological data while performing tasks. And, uh, you know, we use um, different kind of sensors. We, we measure electrodermal activity, eye gaze um, data, uh, and others. And so these will pick up information which is generally not reported while people are doing work. And so in this example, in, the, in this current slide, uh, we are, there's a software tester um, carrying out a routine task, and we're capturing gaze, gaze information, and we're mapping that information to behavioral um, strategies that you can see on the left and right hand side of the screen. Um, so we then use this information to inform, um, you know, team composition, training requirements, and, and so forth. Um, yeah. So this work attempts to improve soft, software engineering, software practices, and, and tools, so as to reduce as much as possible unnecessary mistakes um, that. You know, they may trickle down to, to the software we all use, and unfortunately, sometimes these mistakes can lead to catastrophic outcomes, um, especially in, in more critical scenarios. And this work is carried out in collaboration with the um, Department of Computer Science at the faculty. So on to the, to the next area of research, which is um, universal access to the web. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee, the, the inventor of the World Wide Web, um, says that the, the power of the web is in its universality. Um, access by everyone, regardless of disability, is a core, crucial, um, or essential aspect. I would also add that accessibility is not only important for someone who has a disability, but all of us um, can have accessibility issues from time to time, depending on a number of factors say from using technology in direct sunlight, uh, you don't have enough contrast on the device, um, to having a temporary injury that stops you from, stops us from using our you know, day-to-day -day devices. Um, so apart from disseminating knowledge in collaboration with agencies such as um, C um, FETA, um, CR, the Commission for the Rights of, of Persons with Disability, and ACTU, the Access to Communication Technology Unit, we also carry out research to advance our understanding on a number of open problems. One of our most more, re more recent projects uh, brings together web technology and uh, brain power as well. So we are developing a BCI native web browser, which we believe is the first of, of its kind. Um, this is a specialized browser being built at the faculty and it is meant to um, be used solely via brain signals. So this has been in development for over two years now um, by one of our postgrad students, Alison Camilleri, and we are collaborating with, um, the, with Dr. Tracy Camilleri from the Department of Systems and Control Engineering, as well as research staff from um, the Center for Biomedical Cybernetics. So uh, basically, this project benefits a number of people including people with motor disabilities um, due to, say, a spinal cord injury, for instance, or a progressive um, nervous system disease such as Lou Gehrig's um, AL or ALS that, you know, can, loss, um, can cause loss of muscle control. So literally, we bypass the need uh, for a person to make use of limbs, um, and we bypass the, the actuation as part of, of, of our behavior and instead capture signals directly from a specific part of the brain, which is the exhibited region at the back. Um, and these signals, um, we send them directly to the browser, which will then you know, carry out the action that the user um, uh, would like to, to carry out in real time. 
it's an exciting project um, and uh, to work on it. And of course, we have now started to, to publish these results. And, and as you can see from this clip, they are quite encouraging outcomes. This, this project is, is being funded by uh, the University of Malta Research Funds and has brought together a number of researchers from, from different fields. There are other ongoing projects in this area, but it all boils down, as I said, in, uh, at the start, to making technology work for people as opposed to the other way around. Unfortunately, accessibility in general is um, treated as an afterthought, unfortunately, um, if, if at all, sometimes. And it's our responsibility at the lab and, of course, at, um, to, to work you know, as much as possible to improve people's lives, be it through you know, building bespoke technology for a single individual or through research that can have you know, a wider, um, wider impact on society. So I think that's... That's all Thank you, Dr. Area. Porter. I think those are very yeah. noble aims that you are striving to achieve. For our final speaker, we'll be hearing from Dr. Christian Colombo. Christian is a senior lecturer with the Department of Computer Science, and he will be talking about ongoing work on communication security in the context of a NATO-funded project, especially with secure communication when the stakes are high. Christian. Thank you. So. Uh, security of communication is very crucial because we communicate all the time online and we communicate very sensitive stuff. And this becomes even more uh, challenging in the era of quantum computing. So quantum computing is not yet very practical, what we have today, but it will most probably be practical in the, in the coming uh, years. So security is an ongoing challenge. So if we take physical security if you have a bank for example they would like invest heavily in having like physical uh, safes which are um, strong enough to withhold to to uh, any attack basically of course the the stakes are very high there so they need to invest a lot similarly of course we will have cameras and so on and this same attitude of investing more when when the stakes are high is also applicable in the digital world. So digitally, the, the stakes are becoming very high because, as, as we said, like communication is becoming like, uh, we use it all the time. So we, we pay digitally, we share our secrets digitally. We have, for example, if we mentioned the Internet of Things, we have all our um, devices communicating together. We have our car, which is communicating many components within itself, especially eventually if we have self-driving cars. So yes, we are trusting our lives to secure digital communication. So the stakes are really high and we need to uh, take up this challenge to make sure that we remain safe. I'm going to go to the very basics of what it means to have secure communication. And basically, secure communication depends on encryption. This is the very basis of digital security. So imagine we have a very simple key, which is just a sequence of ones, and we are changing the a hello world into a, a string which we don't understand. Of course, this is not safe, and but I, I wish just to um, convey the idea. So actually, of course, we have more complex keys, we have much more complex algorithms than this basic one. But irrespective of all this, if we don't manage to keep our keys safe, all this infrastructure will be basically useless. So this project is particularly concerned with keeping the keys safe. How do we keep the keys safe? And again, I'm going to use a metaphor from BLI. If we have, if you look at an old city, you would see that you would have the most sensitive parts, which are isolated. They would have extra walls around them and completely isolated. And more than this, you would have soldiers guarding the entrance. So whoever enters or exits this isolated area has to be monitored doing so. How do, do these ideas apply in the digital world? So in the digital world, we use what we call a trusted execution environment, which in practice might be something like this USB key here, 
which has specialized hardware to protect you from particular attacks, which even attack the hardware. You have to trust also the, the hardware itself. And once you put the, the code inside this hardware, it can never be changed. And this is what why it is more trusted than other um, normal devices. And so what we are doing is to keep the keys, which are so, so precious and so crucial to protect us inside this hardware. And all the operations that involve keys will happen here. And that is how we apply isolation in this digital world. We also have monitoring. So we specialized in, in software monitoring. So making sure that anything that is accessing this, which is interacting with this piece of hardware, we are monitoring it. So anything that goes wrong or something which is strange can be detected immediately. And these are our areas from the Maltese um, partner in this consortium, which is funded by NATO. So we have people from Slovakia helping us from Spain, the US, and we hope that given this, these uh, threats, which are on the increase, especially in the possibility of having the quantum computation becoming reality, we hope to be ready when, when this comes. So the security will always be uh, one step ahead. Dr. Colombo, that is much needed, I think. So now we're going to the section of Q&A, and we're going to start with the first question to Ruben. What are the major challenges in Earth observation in the context of Malta? Uh, the major challenge, um, I hinted a bit um, yes, you um, did. during the presentation, is the resolution. Okay, Malta is small, so everything here is smaller. For example, if we look at an agricultural field, Okay, in uh, countries like Italy, big countries, France, and so on, they have larger feeds, so a resolution of 10 meters, which is provided using Sentinel-2, uh, um, is, is sufficient for, for it. But in Malta, 10 meter resolution is a bit problematic, because the parcel size is roughly there. Uh, so we have to improve the resolution of satellite images, and that is part of uh, the work that we did in uh, one project, and uh, we are working on on another, uh, another one. But being working in Malta, it has also advantages. Oh, that's nice. It, being small has its advantages. Because, for example, in the project where we are trying to develop digital elevation models um, using stereo images, we are lucky to have also ground truth information for the whole country, which is something very rare in other places. Yes. So it can be problematic in some areas, it can be an advantage in others. Like most things. Thank you so much. So, another question to Ingrid this time. What is the future of AI in medical imaging? At the moment, there is a lot of work in analyzing the images, like, for example, in MRI. Say, if you have images with, with tumors and you want to identify whether there's a tumor, we don't just, we're not just able to detect whether there's a tumor or not, but we can actually segment it. Okay, so there's a lot of work over there. But I would say, first of all, it's difficult to say what, what the future would be uh, long term. And in AI, long term is not 100 years, but no. <laughs> five years or even less, okay? Because technology um, affects AI a lot. But I would say in the very short term, explainability is, is also very important. So for us to be able to understand these AI models, rather than looking at them as a black box, being able to understand how the AI is working both for legal reasons in, in the medical environment and also for, for us to learn from, from these models. So I would say explainability. Explainability, very interesting. So next question to Chris. Who can benefit from research in accessibility? Right, um, um, so of course, traditionally speaking, um, accessibility was always seen as a way to provide equal access to technology or physical places, physical, physical spaces, but it, it was always treated as a, in the context of people with, with some form of, of disability. This premise is, is, is not correct. Um, accessible technology, generally speaking, refers to technology that respects human limitations that are imposed by, ironically speaking, technology itself. Um, uh, so the way we normally interact with mainstream technology assumes a lot, and it hasn't, hasn't changed much from the 80s and 90s, bar a few exceptions like voice and touch. But um, 
which it could have made it worse, uh, having said it. it. So it is only recent that we have, recently that we are seeing a shift um, in our understanding, but there is so much more to be done. So HCI and accessibility looks at how people interact with technology, as I said earlier, and it, it most importantly, it looks at how people, at the context in which this interaction happens and the challenges that this brings with with this you know with the activity so you don't necessarily have to be a, you don't have to have a visual impairment um, to expect the technology to work in direct sunlight for instance um, where you can treat text properly maybe you don't have a monitor um, at this particular context in this particular context or point in time so 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 this assumption that the monitor is always available um, is, is a fallacy it's not it's not correct so so similarly this applies to motor restrictions so um, you don't you know sometimes you might have some injury that stops you from you know um, using your, your technology so there are guidelines being developed internationally and the legislators are starting to take this into account in fact um, including in malta so so digital technology must be accessible nowadays um, for, for both public uh, and and the private entities yeah so having said that however um, that's for the general case um, and at the university we also look at edge cases um, and other research institutions, of course, um, around the world, where existing technology can't cut it, um, and sort of it's our responsibility to you know to push boundaries a little bit further to understand how existing and novel technology um, can support humans be humans to communicate, uh, nice. to live, and mm -hmm. work. Yes, I like humans being humans. That's what I do best. <laughs> so, a question to Christian: How does secure communication benefit us in everyday life? So, um, like, I think we don't even realize how much we communicate using the computer. When we even use the browser, for example, every simple operation that we do through the browser, that is digital communication. If we are chatting, for example, and of course with the, all the video chats also that, that we have nowadays due to our restrictions, that is secure communication. So all this requires us to have secure, secure communication, because otherwise we are risking our money, our privacy, possibly our lives in the future, also now. But the more that we start depending on, on uh, for example, the Internet of Things, when, where we have all our appliances at home connected together, where we have now robots going around, uh, uh, like cleaning our floors and cars driving on their own, the, the stakes become very high, as we said. And uh, so all this is so relevant to our daily lives. Okay, that I think is very important and quite obvious that we need to be secure. So I'm going to go on to the questions from our audiences. I will be starting with a question for Christian. Can you give us tips on passwords that are safe? Okay, so um, ideally when we make a password, of course we, don't, we shouldn't use basic words which can be attacked through a dictionary attack. We should, as much as possible, not use passwords across uh, different, uh, uh, other different websites using yes. the same password because, of course, if there is a breach in one, all, the, all your passwords will be compromised. And ideally, you would use a chain, a keychain, okay, where you keep all your all your passwords, which you don't need to remember because otherwise, of course, it's a bit uh, difficult to remember. Um, so you can afford to have very long and complex passwords, and you just need to remember one password for your keychain. That would be my my suggestion. That is a very good suggestion. I have a question f to Chris. I'm guessing this one is Chris Porter. What percentage of the population has internet access? Because you were talking about accessibility. All right, so, so in Malta, I guess it's... Mm -hmm. Right, um, uh, I, I, I don't have the, the, the exact figure, but I think in Malta it's one of the, I think one of the, um, Countries that has you know um, that has widespread access, uh, people have widespread access. So 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 um, internet is accessible for most of the people. I don't have the exact figure, but but um, across the different demographics, I think internet access is quite it's quite um, uh, high. 
here in Malta. So um, uh, I, I'm not sure if that was the question. I, I think because when we talk about accessibility and you were saying it's more than just physical impairments, this would be right. one of them in, the, in that respect that yes. um, one needs to have contact with um, the internet, but yes. what if you don't so, even so reach that far? Yes, uh, okay, so, so yes, I think it, in Malta, statistically, statistically speaking, we have a very high rate of internet access, but there's a, so we, we need to be careful not to make an assumption that everyone exactly. has a, a, right. modern, a modern computer and not everyone has the same internet connection. So whenever we're building technology that works over the internet, we have to make sure that um, uh, people with different types of technology exactly. can access that. That's, that's right. You know, I think um, that's what the question was about. To Chris, so we have uh, multiple questions to Chris. Uh, how can the technology you are developing help people with disorders like dementia? Okay. Um, that's a very good question. Um, so, okay, so there are various projects um, that can going on ongoing at the faculty. Um, these two particular um, uh, research areas I, I mentioned during the presentation might not be directly um, beneficial for, for, the, um, for the particular um, uh, condition. However, um, there are other projects that are looking at assisting people live their life to the full independently um, and, uh, you know, um, and, and sort of there are technologies being developed to support and to monitor day-to-day um, -day life. Um, uh, and of course, you know, the risks of having dementia, for instance, would be to um, uh, forget, Yes. you know, doing something which is important, like, you know, taking medication or going out without proper yes. supervision. So mm -hmm. there are projects which, so I, um, one of them is called PEM, which is currently happening at, at the faculty as well. Um, uh, and, and they look at human activity and human activity monitoring in, in part, as well in, in this context as well. So yes, there are other projects that look at, at you know, at dementia, not these two particular projects. Yes, that I of course. Did. And you did mention that there are more. So a question, um, an audience question for Ruben this time. Why do we need to observe the Earth? It's important to measure uh, things to have a bird eye view of the Earth. And, and measure, for example, I don't know. Um, as I said, one of them is on agriculture. There, there is a, a whole field of precision agriculture where people working at that field can get some information that can help them in their practice. Um, we can use also that information also to monitor how much water is being used. And that can be used, for example, for from a government agency, such as Energy and Water Agency, to Monitor, monitor what, what is going on. Right. Um, yes. uh, it's also important, for example, global warming. Definitely. Give us an idea. Mm -hmm. You can go back in time. Sorry. Definitely, I'm agreeing. It is fascinating to know. And uh, these things will empower uh, whoever is on policy to make sure that everything is being taken care of properly. Yes, and we, we can go back in time. For example, there are satellites that, that have been there for decades. Mm -hmm. And we can look, for example, at the global warming, practically looking at thermal images wow. along the years, how, how it was. Amazing. So. Uh, Nothing question to Ingrid this time. How did someone from an engineering background end up becoming interested in the brain and health? That's a very good question. <laughs> so here is an interesting fact. It's not just engineering. To be honest, my PhD is in physics. <laughs> there you go. But, but um, at this level, like when you're doing such research, you realize that physics, engineering, ICT, yes. they, uh, they tend to overlap so much. So the, the boundaries are, are questionable. <laughs> yes. So yes, I would say um, in AI, for example, it's important to have a good background um, in, in the analytics, I mean, in math, for example, which are also skills that you tend to get from engineering. Mm -hmm. So probably that, that helped, I'm sure that that helped. I mean, having a good mathematical background uh, was definitely helpful. <laughs> and of course, uh, being comfortable with coding and with the endurance of getting the code right. <laughs> I, I am so fascinated by all of you and so of the audience. We had to skip a lot of questions because you were, all your research and all the work that's being done by your faculties are so important and our audiences are 
like me, mesmerized by it. So thank you to Ruben, Ingrid, Chris and Christian for taking part in this researcher's den. We definitely learned some new things about the faculty of ICT. So.